Well, it's been a quiet week in Lake Wobegon, Minnesota, my hometown. <laughs> Town of under 2,000. It's been cold there. It's been a cold spring. Tuesday morning here, the temperature was five above zero, which was the lowest low for that day in history. And the high temperature that day was 13, which was the lowest high in history. <laughs> Everybody at the Chatterbox Cafe found out about this from Mr. Magandance, who is one of our weather bores. <laughs> Comes in for coffee, and he has to tell you all about it. He said, yeah, he said, I got up at 6 o'clock this morning on Tuesday and looked at the Weather Channel, and it said, said 5 above on the Weather Channel, but I checked my thermometer. I got a thermometer there by the kitchen window, and that said six above, but you know, I think it was colder than that. That's on the south side of the house, so uh, that's why I got the other thermometer. I put it up on the north side of the house, and I went and checked the, the north thermometer, and doggone it, that said six above. Well, you know, I know it was colder than that. It was, I knew it was going to be colder than five above, because you see, I've never really trusted that thermometer on the, on the north side of the house, because I hung it on the maple tree, and it's hanging on the south side of the maple tree. I don't know. It's the the way the sun hits it or something, or shadows, or maybe it's just the maple tree, I don't know, but it's never, never really been. I'm sure it was about three above out there this morning. Anyway, it was darn cold. When I went to bed last night, about 10.30, I took a look at the thermometer there on the south side of the house, and it was about 15 above when I turned in last night, so I knew it was going to be cold. Actually, the one on the north side uh, was, uh, <laughs> he goes on and on. People die listening to Mr. Magandance. <laughs> People just sit and see their whole lives pass in front of them. It's good that we have a cold spring in Minnesota because we are such romantic people that if it were warm and our hearts got carried away as they might in warm weather, it's, it's terrible to think of what might actually happen to us. We're so easily aroused, <laughs> fantasies of romance, that uh, we need to ease into spring with these with these cold temperatures. They got a letter in through the post office from Paris, France this last week. Mr. Beamer found it. It wasn't addressed to anybody in town. It was actually addressed to a guy in Duluth. It was a wrong delivery. But still, it was interesting. <laughs> a number of people came in and looked at it. It was an airmail letter in a very thin onion skin envelope, and you could make out the handwriting through it, and it was a woman's handwriting. And from the handwriting, you could tell how beautiful and elegant that woman was. And she was writing about some guests who had come to her house for dinner. And then all of a sudden, out of the clear blue, she said, I miss you, Ed. I miss you every day, and I always will. And you thought to yourself, if she could miss a guy from Duluth that much, how much more <laughs> could she miss one of us in Lake Wobega? This is the sort of thing that people think about in the spring, and imagine how much more we would think about it if it were warm. It's a good thing we're having a kind of a cold spring. It's the time of year when people's hopes get away from them, when people feel great sense of romance. Even farmers feel romance this time of year. Roger Headland was out walking the field, seeing how soon he might be able to get in and cultivate. There were ice on the puddles in between the rows in the field. He followed it way out up to the top of the rise, and he stood out there on Tuesday. It was cold, and yet you could smell spring in the air and green. And he felt so lucky to be there and to be a farmer and to do real work in the world and to be independent and not to be one of those pitiful people living in the city, working in offices, doing boring work and pretending to like it and going home and watching boring television and once a year taking a boring trip and getting stupider and stupider. <laughs> but instead, to be a farmer and 
to really experience spring. People in the cities don't experience spring, he thought. They, they just, they can't wait for it to be summer. They want it to be like California. There was a family from the city who came driving through two springs ago. They came driving the back roads outside Lake Wobegon, mother and a dad and two teenage sons. And they were driving along County Road and a whole group of deer suddenly burst up out of the ditch and ran across the road. They jammed on their brakes. But one deer ran into the side of their car. They stopped. They got out to look at it. It was lying there on the road. It was a young deer. And his right front leg was completely broken. He lay there looking up at them with his big deer eyes. They felt so terrible. They knelt by the deer. And they petted him. They stroked his chin. They said, let's take him to town, to a vet. We'll get his leg fixed. They picked him up gently and put him into the trunk and closed the trunk. And they drove slowly towards town. And they'd gone a couple of miles, and the deer came out of his shock. And he started kicking the trunk lid. And he kicked hard. They could hear the deer going back, bang, 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 bang. And he kicked out the back seat. And suddenly the deer was in the car with him. <laughs> and the deer was crazy. He was kicking, flailing around. Well, they, they ran right off the road. They ran up into a field. It was Daryl Tollerud's field. He was not far away. In his pickup, he drove over to see what was the matter. Here was a deer leaping around inside the car, <laughs> trying to get out. People from the cities going frantic. Daryl opened up the car. He reached in. He grabbed the deer. And he got him out. He laid him down on the ground. He saw his leg was broken. He went to the pickup truck. He got his 22 rifle. He brought it over. He aimed it at the deer's head. And he shot him. And the people from the city said, How could you do that? Daryl explained to them patiently, You can't set a broken leg of a wild animal, of a deer. It just doesn't work. They looked at him as if he were a war criminal. <laughs> they said, well, I hope you're going to give him a burial, not just leave him lying here. Give him a burial, Daryl said. I'm going to eat him. <laughs> they looked at him in horror as if he were a cannibal. And the woman screamed out loud. And just at that moment, the deer leaped to his feet. <laughs> and the deer took off running across the field. Darrow fired two more shots. He didn't hit him. Deer disappeared in the woods. <laughs> that spring. <laughs> Nothing wants to die in the spring. <laughs> Everything wants to live if it possibly can. A farmer would understand this. It's the time of year when old men smell spring in the air and they get out their gloves and their balls and they go out to the ballpark and they throw a ball around and they play a little baseball based on their memory of having done this in the past. <laughs> and they do it in the hope that this year through exercise and regular diet they will they will turn back the terrible things that have been happening to their bodies for the past 30, 40, or 50 years. And they will at last be in shape again so that attractive strangers sidle up to them in public places and openly flirt with them and throw themselves at us and seriously challenge our commitment to monogamy. They go out and they play baseball for a little while. But you can't run your body just based on memories of grace. <laughs> and soon you feel very, very old indeed. This happened to Ronnie. He was out at the ballpark. And he was running around with some of the other whippets and throwing a ball around. And then out in deep center field, he discovered a silver ring was there in the grass. He picked it up. And suddenly he remembered a story he'd heard when he was a boy. He wondered if this may not have, if this might not be Babe Ruth's 
silver ring. Babe Ruth, who came through Lake Wobegon in a barnstorming team when he was old and sick, retired from the Yankees. He was sick with the flu. He couldn't go out and play in the game, but he came out just to please the crowd. He came out in the ninth inning, and he hit a home run on that fall day, and he ran around the bases slowly. And there was always a story that the babe had lost a silver ring at that game back, back 60 years ago. He looked at the ring, and he took it down to the town hall, to the town clerk, Viola Torres, for the lost and found, Ronnie did. And he went off to the sidetrack tap to have a beer. Well, a rumor got started around town that a ring had been found at the ballpark that was silver and was encrusted with precious gems. And it had been appraised at $35,000 <laughs> and that Ronnie could claim his money in 30 days. And by the time this rumor reached Ronnie at the sidetrack tap, he had had six beers <laughs> and had forgotten what the ring looked like. And he started to think what he would do with this $35,000. <laughs> and he had decided to buy a brand new Lincoln Continental with wire wheels and to go on a long trip and just let whatever happen, happen. When Pastor Inquist came in and said, thanks, Ronnie. Thanks for finding our napkin ring. It was a napkin ring that had belonged to the Inkvists, and they had sent the kids away to his parents last January, one night, so the pastor and his wife could have a romantic dinner. But as so often happens when the kids go away, the parents got into a fierce argument, <laughs> and she said something to him at the table there with the candles burning. She said something to him that made him stalk out of the house with the napkin and napkin ring in his hand. He threw the napkin down on the ground, he stomped on it, and he took the napkin ring and he threw it as far as he could. They live about a block from the ballpark. <laughs> he was darned mad. He went back in the house and, then, and it was pretty much over then. He'd pretty well gotten it out of his system and they had their romantic dinner and they never referred to the cause of the argument, which was her mentioning a meeting of the board of the Lutheran Church that the pastor had gone to, at which Val Tollefson had introduced a complicated new cost-benefit system of analyzing what the minister's salary and benefit needs should be. And this complicated cost-benefit analysis system in the end meant that the pastor would not get a raise this year and that Pastor and Mrs. Inquist would not go to Orlando for the minister's retreat in January. And she had said to him at dinner, she had said, why didn't you speak up and say something? And he said, because I had no idea what they were talking about. <laughs> and she said, that has never stopped you in the past. <laughs> well, these things happen, but it was hard on Ronnie, as you can imagine, to have $35,000 and then to have the Pastor Inquist say, thanks, Ronnie, for finding our napkin ring and hand you a $5 reward. <laughs> $35,000. To five dollars is a long, long way to fall. But this happens to us in the spring. Our hopes get so high and then they fall to the ground. They had the cars out at the high school. The two driver ed cars were out and Marv, the driver ed teacher, was starting behind the wheel training this last week now that the uh, Snow on the ice mostly melted. When he does behind the wheel instruction, Marv likes to take Enderol, which is a tranquilizer. <laughs> and it keeps him calm there in the passenger seat. 
so that he, so that he doesn't just shriek and, uh, and so that he doesn't keep stomping on the, on the floorboard there. And he went out for the, the first behind the wheel instruction with Tracy Halverson, who's a very pretty young woman who's the daughter of Mr. Halverson, the school principal. But he didn't have the dosage quite right. <laughs> he had taken a little bit too much Enderol, and Marv became a little catatonic <laughs> there in the front seat. And when he came to and realized what was going on, up until that point, it had just been a terrible dream. The car was in a field. It was out in a field and it was dusk. Time had gone by and Tracy was sitting beside him, sobbing uncontrollably. Well, when you come to consciousness this suddenly, your mind leaps to conclusions. And Marv immediately assumed that he had touched her in an inappropriate way <laughs> and that when he got back to town, he would be sent to a correctional institution <laughs> for the rest of his adult life. <laughs> he felt terrible about this and he got out of the car. He was going to walk to the nearest highway and hitchhike and find his way to Mexico <laughs> where he could start over. But the Enderol had affected his motor skills. <laughs> what it, whatever he had had been affected by the Enderol, and he was unable to keep his balance. And he started going downhill. There was a slope, and he was going downhill, and he wound up in a gully. There were big rocks there. It was a dry creek bed, and he fell down there. He lay there. He could hear dogs barking in the distance. He thought, well, they're coming to get me now. <laughs> he was thinking of killing himself by picking up a large rock and smashing himself in the head with it. But Tracy Halverson came out to find him, and she stood just above him on the slope, and she was sobbing. <gasps> she was crying. She said, Mr. Sorensen, you're going to flunk me, aren't you? <laughs> Because I got lost and I wound up in a field. You're going to flunk me. And I'm not going to get my driver's license. And I'm not going to be able to work in St. Cloud at the catalog store. And I'm going to have to work at the drive-in. And I hate it. Marv heard this. <laughs> he said, Tracy, we're teaching driver ed here, not geography. <laughs> Sense of direction has nothing to do with it whatsoever. <laughs> I've always considered you to be one of the best drivers in the class, Tracy. <laughs> and as far as I'm concerned, you're going to get an A. Well, she ran up to him. She helped him up to his feet. And she threw her arms around him. And she kissed him. He leaped away from her. He leaped away from her. Don't, he said, don't. They walked back toward the car. He opened the door for her. He went to get in his side. And then he heard a twig break. A twig broke about 30 feet away. He turned and he saw a deer. A deer was walking towards him. A deer who had a very bad limp. It was dark, but the deer was staring straight at him. Marv reached back for the door handle, and he opened it up slowly as the deer charged him. He got in and he slammed the door just as the deer hit it with his horns. That deer hit that car hard, and before Marv got the car started up and got it out of there, that deer kicked that car. 15, 16 times. You can see the scratches long side the car on the door. That sort of thing happens in the spring. <laughs> it's a powerful time of year. That's the news from Lake Wobegon. <laughs> For all the women are strong, 
All the men are good looking. And all the children are above average. Thank you, Rich Dworsky. 